guys, it's your boy Luke here for our DFS core picks at this week's Pebble Beach Pro-Am. Here in this video, we're going to cover my top six DFS plays across a variety of salary ranges to give you guys an idea of some of the foundational pieces in my player pool. Last week in this same video, you went five for six in getting guys through the cut. You had the eventual winner in Luke List as our bread and butter play. Highlights like a Justin Thomas, Sahith Agala, Patrick Rogers, Maverick McNeely, our only real miss being Sam Burns, but I kind of did tell you that Luke List had a good chance of winning this week as well. I'll just go ahead and cut to the clip, show you guys exactly what I'm talking about. That's but we did not going to look good, right? 212, 200 in the world, 121, 152. That's really the X factor for Luke List. If he goes out there this week, ends up losing, let's say, one or two strokes for the entire event on the greens, probably finishes in the top 20. It gets a little bit closer to just two strokes, I'm um, sorry, one stroke or even zero strokes to the field lost. Um, could very well top five. And of course, if he has that once every season type of performance where he goes out there and actually gains on the greens, could end up taking this whole thing down. Like so. I said, though, didn't have the personal investment there, but a lot of people out there in the community did, including a few people that messaged me on Discord. So that was great to see that some of you were able to take advantage of that clearly modeled well really a community win and anytime that happens you got to feel good for the community right we're all really trying to help each other out here whether you're breaking it down for dfs or the outright market so you're not going to get any bad vibes going that way for me in terms of the rest of our picks we went five for six getting our value picks through the cut it's really respectable considering they're all 7500 dollars and below and with our fades and sleepers all three fades didn't really make a huge mark. None of them even came close to cracking the optimal lineup. And DJ, the one of our three sleepers that really came through for us, didn't end up cracking the optimal lineup, but surely did a lot better than people expected. So really got to give myself maybe an 8 out of 10 for our picks last week. Obviously, weren't able to take down any large field GBPs because we weren't well over the field on Will Zalatoris. But this week, I have a lot of confidence that we could go ahead and pretty much bring this whole thing down. With that being said, we have Pebble Beach, which is a completely different monster than Torrey Pines. At Torrey Pines it was more of a ball striking paradise. Here at Pebble Beach, you gotta have a complete game. Obviously, I already did my course breakdown on my channel, so if you haven't already seen that, I will have a link down in the description. But this is a place where you gotta have your irons. Your around the green game has to be stout as well. Some of the smallest greens on tour. And we're still dealing with the tricky Poa Anua surface. So you can't really have one specialty over the other. You have to have a complete game to win here at Pebble Beach, and that's what we've seen over the years. Um, so with that being said, with some of the differences here in mind, let's go ahead and hop into our top six picks for this week. All right, on the screen, you guys can see our Patreon projections. As per usual, if you're looking to get access to these as they change throughout the week, as the player pool becomes more complete, any changes are made due to the weather, make sure to go ahead and check out the link in the description. Just a dollar for the month. One of the best values in all of the industry. But first, we're going to start off with a little bit of a review of the key stats. So if you guys haven't seen the course breakdown video, this will be especially important. If you already have, go ahead and skip ahead to the picks, right? There'll be a little timestamp down in the description there, so you can go ahead and do so. But for anybody that hasn't seen it yet, Approach play, particularly from the 100 to 150 yard range, those two buckets are going to be extremely important. You're dealing with golf courses right around 7,000 yards, which means that players are going to have scoring wedges in hand on almost every single hole. The only holes where you're not going to have a scoring wedge in hand might be the par fives if you're going for two, and then the par threes, which definitely still have some length. Most of them right around 180 yards, a few a little bit shorter, a few over 200 yards. But overall, you're looking at a ton of wedges. So you can see for the key stats at all these golf courses, you're going to see that 100 to 125 yard range in pretty much all of them, right? Up here, it's extremely important at Pebble, even at Spyglass and Monterey Peninsula, where they'll be at for two of the first three days. You see it also making an appearance. One thing we'll mention is that Monterey Peninsula is by far the easiest of these golf courses. That's why you see birdie or better percentage playing such a huge mark there. Spyglass, the hardest of the three golf courses. That's why you see around the green as the number one key stat. People only hit 49% of greens last year um, at Spyglass. Again, it was only one of two courses last year. Monterey Peninsula was not part of the rotation, so we don't have the statistics for that golf course. Um, but Spyglass Hill played even more difficult than usual. So this year, we're giving it a little bit of extra emphasis. 
But of course, the most important course for this week is Pebble Beach. It's where we'll be playing on Sunday. We'll have one round there during those first three days as well before the cut line on Saturday. You're looking at around the green approach play like we've already mentioned for all three golf courses, but also putting on Poa Nua. You're dealing with pure Poa Nua surfaces like we saw at the south course at Torrey Pines, which tend to be tricky, even some of those three to four foot putts, especially when they have a little bit of undulation to them, become extremely difficult to make. You're going to see some of the lowest putting numbers here at Pebble Beach that we'll see all year, and that's despite having some of the smallest greens on tour. You're dealing with 3,500 square foot per average greens here at Pebble Beach, which you would think would lead to better putting statistics, but with how tricky that they are with the POA newest surface, that's exactly what we get. Let's move on to the core picks now. So the first core pick going to be Daniel Berger. I obviously still like Patrick Cantlay. I think he's a little bit too obvious of a play. And in terms of my modeling, you see Daniel Berger edges Cantlay ever so much slightly. In terms of points per dollar, also gets the edge there. He's somebody who's pretty much always played well at Pebble Beach. It's a short golf course, which plays exactly into his skill set. And it's a golf course where you have to be good with your scoring wedges. If there's one thing that Daniel Berger does best, Pretty much better than everyone else in the stud tier range, it's hit his scoring wedges. So you love to see that. You also love to see the fact that he's historically been a great putter on the Poa Noah surface, gaining nearly half a stroke per round. And last week at Torrey Pines, he was dealing with a little bit of a back issue. So that is the one caveat that we have for Daniel Berger here. We're going to want to pay attention to some of his news conferences. If he says anything about the back, maybe some of those range reports to kind of get a feel for what he looks like on the range because during what i guess it was friday's round because we ended on saturday he was grabbing his back after almost every single tee shot he was getting the driver out there only 270 yards at times i mean he was hitting driver that wasn't him hitting three wood off the tee he was clearly trying to tone it back he still ended up shooting three under which is extremely impressive for playing at the south course um, so even though he was dealing with an injury, he got away with it, right? He went out there on Sunday, did not look like he was grabbing the back. It looked like he must have been over the injury fairly quickly. So as long as nothing comes up this week in the media about that back, as long as that seems to be an afterthought, this is going to be an absolute smash spot for Berger. And I see a couple of people around the industry kind of talking about the injury, um, having a little bit of, let's say, they're a little worried about it, right? They're not going in with full force because of it. Uh, I'm going to be all over Berger if he's lower owned, right? I was expecting him to be probably 25, 30% owned to this week. If we get him sub 20%, he's going to be an even nicer GPP play. So really like him there. Take a look at some of the shots gain metrics just to give you an idea of how good he's been playing of late. Gaining nearly 0.8 shots gained approach per round. That's pretty much unheard of. That's Colin Morikawa levels, Justin Thomas in his prime type of levels. He's been gaining around the green, which isn't something that we typically see from Daniel Berger, um, which is great to see that he's plugged that hole in his game. The off the tee play hasn't been the best. He's really never the best player off the tee. He tends to be accurate, but doesn't really get it out there far. But at a course, all three venues this week, right around 7,000 yards. That is far from a prerequisite for success. Distance, of course, always a boost. It's greater to be hitting shorter wedges into these greens. And you're going to be hitting approach wedges, and some of your peers are going to be hitting pitching wedges. That is just an inherent advantage. But for Daniel Berger, that he hasn't needed that, right? He's been great at this golf course in the past. He's great with some of his long irons. We take a look at his scoring wedges. He's number seven in the world with his greens and regulation. But in some of these shorter wedge ranges, still excellent, right? You can see he's number 16 in the world from 150 to 175. He's number 60 from 125 to 150 and 46 from 50 to 125. Um, these aren't elite levels, but when you compare them to some of the other studs up top, He's head and shoulders better than them, right? Some of the best wedge players in the world tend to be some of these 7, 8K type of golfers, which we're going to get to here in a second. There's plenty of them that I like this week. But in terms of the studs up top, um, Daniel Berger usually gets it done in these money ranges. Take a look at the punting stats. They're not jumping off the walls, but still consistently good across the board. So at $10,500, there's an argument to be made that he's the best course fit this week, not just the... Second best player in the field. That's clearly Patrick Cantley is the number one pedigree player. But in terms of course fit, I actually like him per the numbers more than Cantley. So he's going to be my most exposed play this week. Probably somebody that might actually crack the 50% exposure mark for me, which is something rare, something I don't do very often for 150 maxes. But given his course fit, given his pedigree here, I think it's well warranted. 
All right, as our second man in, we have Matt Fitzpatrick at $9,200. I expect him to also come in with relatively low ownership. He's somebody that we haven't seen for quite some time. He's been playing a lot more on the European Tour, but at number 25 in the official World Golf Rankings, you can argue that he's easily the most mispriced golfer on pretty much the entire slate, regardless of price range. Let's go ahead and start off with his game. He's more of a short game specialist, one of the best putters in the entire world. You hear that from pretty much anybody who's played from him. In terms of his shots game putting on Poa Nua, doesn't look all that great, slightly negative right there, but that's something we can pretty much immediately throw out the window. He only has eight measured rounds on the surface, so we're not going to hold that against him. We know that historically he's gaining close to half a stroke per round putting, and if he's going to get back to that type of baseline with the short game with the wedges that we know that he has, going to be a great play here. So let's go ahead and start with the wedge play. From the 50 to 100 yard range, that more of a feel wedge range, on the European Tour, number one. From the um, 100 to 125 range, which is going to be peppered extremely often for tour players here at Pebble Beach, you're also looking at a top 10 number on the European Tour. This is somebody who's great with scoring wedges. He's one of the best putters on tour. And his shots gained off the tee numbers when we've seen him over here on the American side have been immaculate, gaining nearly a third of a stroke per round. So if he has this complete game that we're looking for, particularly when he doesn't have to hit some of those long irons, it's just what we've seen in his limited sample size. This course should, should set up perfectly for him. In the past, he does have a missed cut here, also just a 60th place finish, which isn't the greatest course history, that's for sure. It's probably why he's still only down here at $9,200. But if he returns to any of the form that we've seen on the European Tour, this guy could go out and easily win this golf tournament. The outright numbers on him at 45 to 1 or even 50 to 1 that you saw at some of the books to start this week, it's a little bit disrespectful, something that I would have hopped in on. Right now, even at 40 to 1, something that I'd consider adding to my betting card very well. May by the end of the week, we'll have a video on that, so make sure to look forward to that. If I end up adding them, it'll be in that video. But again, with the skill set fit here, the expected low ownership, he's great on link style golf courses. That's where a lot of his wins on the European tour have been. And Pebble Beach, Pebble Beach is a link. So, like a lot of the vibes there, love the low ownership and going to be our second man in. Next up, we have Kevin Kisner at $9,000. Very similar player to Matt Fitzpatrick. A great putter. Somebody who we've seen for years and years and years on Poa Nua make a ton of putts. Also somebody that tends to be accurate off the tee, which is useful at a Pebble Beach. All three courses this week. Also a great wedge player. So just from a course fit perspective, we know that Kevin Kisner fits the metric. So even though the numbers don't necessarily pan that out, that's due to his slump, right? And towards the middle of 2021, even towards the end of 2021, it lasted quite some time. He was in a really bad slump. He missed seven straight cuts before and he ended up winning a golf tournament. Uh, but then it's looked like a completely different player since. So we really got to try and cut out some of those shots gain metrics. And if you take a look at just his last 20 measured rounds, so really try to confine that down there. He's gaining across all four major statistical categories, but most notably over half a stroke per round on approach. So even if we look over here at the shots gain metrics, not going to look great. You can see losing on approach, losing off the tee, at least still gaining around the green and putting. But we really got to keep in mind that if we go ahead and crunch that down just four more rounds, which isn't all that much off the 24 measured rounds that we have right here, um, he goes back into the positive in both these categories. So Kevin Kisner has looked like a much better player since that win. Of course, last time out at Wiley, gained four strokes on approach. If he can continue to be an extremely accurate player off the tee, you can see he's the number 12 player in the world in terms of driving accuracy. If he can continue to be extremely accurate with those scoring wedges, put to a quarter of a stroke per round average like he has in Pua Nua for his career, I like his chances to not only make a cut, he's an extremely high floor player to go out and do so, um, but I really like his chances to go out and contend as well. So he will be our bread and butter play. A little bit more expensive than I like going to for this type of player. I usually try to be in the middle of the 8K range. But as you'll see with our last three picks, able to save enough salary to go ahead and do so. Let's go ahead and move on to our value pick, which is going to be Adam Hadwin at $7,400. He comes in as my model's number 23 ranked play on the board. 
gaining nearly eight tenths of a stroke per round on Poa Noah, which is ridiculous, but that's over a large sample size. This is somebody who grew up on the surface. He played his college golf out west as well. So no surprise to see him having that type of success. And if we take a look at some of his recent shot gain metrics, they're not going to be jumping off the board, but they're enough to get by at this venue, right? He's losing off the tee, but gaining on approach, gaining around the green, and of course, gaining putting. So you like to see that. We should expect some positive regression with the putter just because of how familiar he is with these surfaces. A lot of his measured rounds have been on Bermuda grass. Um, not his best surface, you know, still gaining, still doing much better than the field. But when he gets out here on the West Coast surfaces, um, this is really where he starts to shine. It's really where I try to target people like an Adam Hadwin. So um, the off the tee play, he still is accurate. You can see over here, he's number 55 in the world in terms of driving accuracy. Um, usually even a little bit more accurate than that. So you can see these off the tee numbers pretty much no undoubtedly improve. Um, you're not really looking to hit 300 yard drives here very often unless you're at Monterey Peninsula. Um, at the other two golf courses, particularly Pebble Beach that has the shots gain numbers, um, you're looking for more accuracy the distance. So um, could very well see Hadwin gaining off the tee this week. You could also very well see him gaining on approach around the green, putting pretty much across the board. So really like him this week, as long as he comes in with respectable ownership. I do expect him to be a popular play just because of the statistical modeling. Um, it's not going to be a surprise to see him popping up. He's been with decent recent form. We know he's such a good putter on this Poa Anua surface. Um, so as long as he doesn't eclipse like the 15% mark, um, I will be more than okay with getting him. So right around the 25, 30% mark if he's owned a lot. If it's closer to 10% where I'm hoping him to be, um, maybe towards a quarter of my lineups. But either way, a great value option. Somebody that I really think has a good chance to go out and make a cut. You can see I have him at a 65% chance of making the cut. Um, given his course fit, given what we're saying about his Poa Nua stats, probably closer to 75% with all of that in mind uh, and somebody I really like. Let's move on to our diamond in the rough. That is going to be Charles Schwartzel at 7100 bucks, who we haven't seen on the PGA Tour since the fall, right? He hasn't come over for any of these first four events. He's somebody who's been playing on the European Tour. He has one missed cut, one made cut where he didn't do all that well, ended up finishing 30th. I believe um, that was both cut events. So he ended up making the cut that weekend, which is good to see at the very least. Uh, but this golf course is set up for Charles Schwartzel. Schwartzel is one of the best wedge players in all of the world. We've known that for quite some time. Anytime we get Schwartzel at a golf course, we got to be accurate off the tee. You got to hit those scoring wedges. And particularly when we get him on Poa Nua, where he is a significant gainer on the greens, um, he's going to have a great week. And that's exactly the type of setup that we have here. Um, every other putting surface, he's a loser. But on Poa Nua, he's one of those savants, much like a Luke List last week. Um, but that when he gets on these bumpy surfaces, um, things tend to go his way. A lot of that is just due to familiarity. I'm not a surprise for somebody like Schwartzel from down there in South Africa. I believe a lot of the golf courses down there also have Poa Anua grass. So it's $7,100. I like the price tag here. You know, if he was coming in with a couple top tens of the European tour, you're probably looking at 10, 15% ownership at this price tag. Um, could even have been around $8,000 coming in with that type of form, um, which makes him an even more attractive play. This is a known commodity, not somebody who we need to see form coming in for him to go out and pop, um, particularly when he gets on these surfaces where he does all so well. And this is with a massive sample size, right? Schwartzel's been around forever. This is over a 40 round sample size in terms of his Poa Anua numbers. Um, in terms of his fits, he's a good fit for the um, Monterey Peninsula course, um, really good with some of those long irons. For Pebble Beach, also a great course fit. We already talked about those scoring irons. Um, going down to some of the advanced metrics, just to give you guys an idea. Let's see over the last 24 measured rounds, not doing the best, right? Again, we haven't seen them since the fall. So I'm willing to give you guys a little bit of a break, particularly when they're, they're our diamond in a rough pick, right? People are expecting to be relatively low owned because despite not having his best stuff, look where he's been with the scoring wedges. Number 55 in the world. And that's despite, again, losing across all these shots gain categories. He still retained the wedge play. Imagine if he returns to his sharp self when he's in control of his game, setting himself up for a lot of opportunities. Uh, he's, he's going to be number maybe t number one in the field with the scoring wedges. He's, he's really up there um, with guys like a Patrick Cantley, guys like a Daniel Berger in terms of that scoring wedge ability. Um, so I really like him at $7,100. It will be a core pick in our diamond in the rough. And now lastly, for our flyer pick, and this doesn't feel as much as a flyer pick, right? It's Ryan Armour at $6,900. 
He's been priced down in this field because he hasn't really been playing his best golf. Uh, he's gotten off to a lot of rough stretches in round one where he shot 3-4 over par and really put himself out of contention even despite some really nice rounds on Friday. Um, he was able to save one of his cuts. I believe he shot 7 under on a Friday to go out and backdoor himself into a cut line. But when you're hardly making cuts on the number, you're not really going to make a splash on the weekend. So he hasn't really been a solid fantasy player. That's why we see him at this type of price tag. But given his course fit, this is also a perfect venue for him. He's a short hitter off the tee, does it with the accuracy, more of a plotter for sure, much like a Charles Schwartzel, you know, not somebody who's known for his distance. But the one thing Ryan Armour is known for is that wedge play and, of course, the putting on Poa Nua. He's not one of the best putters on tour historically. He's just a little bit above average. You can see on Poa Nua, starting to get towards the elite tier range. When you start to get close to a quarter of a stroke per round, um, that's when you're starting to make significant gains on the field. Um, close to a stroke per tournament, um, that's significant, right? Um, if you're gaining a whole stroke over your competitors in a tournament, um, that could be 10 to 15 places on a leaderboard right there, let alone if you have it with the other three shots gain categories. Um, so Ryan Armour, not only great with the scoring wedges, great with the putting on Poa Nua. He's accurate off of the tee. If we take a look at some of the advanced metrics, because he hasn't been his greatest self of late, I'm not really going to paint the best picture. Let's go ahead and look at him, though, right? You know, gaining slightly off the tee, gaining slightly on approach, losing around the green, which shouldn't be all that much of an issue this week if he's on with his approach play. Um, that's the thing, right? Uh, if you're looking for guys to make a cut, especially the guys up top, you want them to have their around the green play because more than likely you're going to miss your fair share of greens, right? But if you're taking flyers down low, you're looking for guys that kind of have to have everything going their way to make a cut. You can you can live with them not having the best around the green play, right? Because you're gonna you're dealing with players that aren't perfect. Um, I'd much rather be targeting guys that are great off the tee and great on approach than guys that are great around the green and good in one of those categories. It's just it's harder to find the guys that are good in both these categories. And you can see, despite not having his best play, he's gaining across both categories, which is. A little bit surprising, to be honest with you. I did not expect to see that. Um, something else to know with Ryan Armour is that, of course, he's losing putting, which isn't a surprise. On Bermuda grass, he's not his best self. Um, but we could see some positive regression with the putter there. So um, if you take a look at some of the wedge stats, he's typically very good with the wedge play. You can see the accuracy number 11 in the world. That's not surprising at all. He's number 50 in the world from the 125 to 150 range. Um, that's going to be one of the most utilized ranges this week. This 150 to 175, not as common. Um, not as good with the 50 to 125, so he could improve there. So he's still been a gainer with the iron play, despite not having that wedge play of normal, which um, is a little bit surprising there as well. So hopefully we see a little bit of regression there. He could have an even better irons week this week than what we've seen over the last few months. Great course fit at Spyglass, great course fit at Pebble Beach. Um, I don't expect him to be chalk either. So is by far the highest cut rate of anybody in this range. Getting close to that 60% mark. You can see there's a few guys close to 50%, like a Doc Redman, Bob um, Bo Hogue, 54% um, for an Austin Eckroat. Uh, but number one would be Ryan Armour. So he's giving you a little bit of safety that you'll desperately need this week down low to spend down for lineups. And uh, towards the bottom of this player board, you can see that there's a few guys I'm taking shots on. But not anyone I'd really say is a core play, right? What really separates Ryan Armour here is that he's a known commodity. We know that he's accurate off the tee, good with that wedge play, historically good on this surface. Um, so he should be at least a cut maker for us, really checks all the boxes. Um, the only reason he's not a core play, like somebody that we think is going to contend here, um, is the around the green play, right? Like I said, around the green play is important because you're going to miss your fair share of greens here. Um, but for Ryan Armour to go and have a solid performance, you're hoping he's not missing all that many greens. So... Um, does have a little bit of a lower floor because of that around the green play, uh, but for sure still has that top end upside. That's all I've got for this week's core picks. As always, going to have even more DFS content dropping throughout the week. So if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, make sure you do so before you get on out of here so you don't miss any of that. Whether it's our value picks, our fades and sleepers, our weekly DFS live stream, or our showdown content for all the single round slates, you're not going to want to miss any of it. All just as good as this content here, all data-based, um, all free to give you guys an idea of what to do for those slates. Also, before we get on out of here, go ahead and let me know down in the chat who you guys think wins this golf tournament. For me, I think Patrick Cantlay is the guy I'd have to go with personally. Um, didn't write him up as a core play here because it's such an obvious play, but has decent course history here. In terms of recent form, he's number one in the world. 
the course fit is immaculate, right? He's great, but those scoring wedges, one of the best in that category. And Ampoa Anua, because he's a West Coast kid, grew up over here, um, has that familiarity and has shown that with his stats. Um, so really no holes in that game there. That's what I've, I'd have to go ahead with. But go ahead and let me know who you're taking down in the comments. Appreciate you guys coming by, enjoying the video. Make sure to like the video if you haven't already. Um, we'll have the value picks coming out here in just a few hours, so stay tuned for that. Until next time, guys, have a great Tuesday, great rest of your week if you're watching this later on, and let's get this cash this weekend.